Well, uh, welcome. I'm, I'm very happy for you uh, both, uh, you all, to be here tonight. I'm ecstatic to have our great speakers. Um, and let me introduce them by, individually by their backgrounds. To my far right, I have Kevin Callahan. Kevin was the co-founder of Map My Fitness, that many of you will know was sold to Under Armour. And he's also the COO of Maggie Louise Confections. Kevin, as the COO of Maggie Louise Confections, is a luxury chocolate brand headquartered in Austin, Texas. In 2014, they were selected as one of Oprah's favorite things, and their products have been on the Today Show several times, and, we've even, and they've even been featured in Food and Wine magazine, People magazine, In Style, and various other publications. Their focus uh, of, of both Kevin and Maggie, um, their focus is on making people feel special through storytelling with unique and luxurious, luxurious confections. They are currently uh, servicing online retail events online retail, excuse me, events and corporate custom gifting. Client list includes very notable brands such as L'Oreal Paris, Jimmy Choo, Lexus, JW Marriott, and John Frieda. Prior to um, MLC, uh, Kevin co-founded and led, and led the Innovations Group within Map My Fitness, a venture-backed Inc. 500 company focused on empowering the active lifestyle through health and fitness websites and mobile applications. MMF was acquired in, un, by Under Armour in 2014. Kevin is also active in the local technology entrepreneurship community. He has been a Dreamit and Techstars mentor. He has also been a guest lecturer on entrepreneurship at John Hopkins University and has spoken on panels and at conferences regarding the impact of data and technology on fitness and the businesses around fitness. Maggie, to my immediate right, uh, Maggie Callahan, you'll know, husband and wife dynamic duo here. Uh, uh, with a taste for decadence and an eye for style and an abundance of passion. I think we can see the passion, Maggie. Um, Ma Maggie Louise Callahan um, offers sweet lovers everything that they would true, excuse me, everything they would truly love in the chance to enjoy classic candy flavors in unique chocolate styles. Beloved combinations such as chocolate and peanut butter, malted milk balls, and salted caramels have moved uptown and traded their ho-hum taste and candy design for a polished flavor and sophisticated look. Each artisan confection is handcrafted in Austin, Texas from the finest, freshest ingredients, including El Rey chocolate and Curve coffee, and beautifully packaged in the company's signature lavender and black boxes. And they have, uh, I have to ask you, hold your seats until the end. Don't rush, but they've generously brought uh, a, a, a large display of chocolates for your treats afterwards. Yes. But they're being guarded by people out there at the moment. <laughs> and, and you have to stay through the whole hour. <laughs> that way of bribing you. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to have this husband and wife team uh, to share their entrepreneurial experiences both in the past and, and today. And while Maggie doesn't say this, Maggie is also a JD. She's a lawyer originally. So big change in profession there. May, may I start? Let's go back a little bit though, if we can, Kevin. Let's talk about Map My Fitness. How did this entrepreneurial journey start for you there? Well, so um, conveniently enough, um, my first company I ever started was in high school, and it was a candy company. Yeah. I uh, was uh, at a boarding school in Africa. Uh, my parents were, worked for the State Department. Um, I was smart enough to realize that if your parents work in the State Department, you have access to uh, subsidized shipping on behalf of the U.S. government. <laughs> so um, essentially, I had care packages mailed to my boarding school where I had American uh, chocolate. Uh, an American candy, and so um, that was my, my first real uh, taste, if, if you were, of, of entrepreneurship. Uh, from there, uh, I actually ended up uh, going to uh, school in Baltimore. I went to Johns Hopkins. I actually chose Johns Hopkins because I was a space nerd, and I really wanted to be a rocket scientist uh, in the true form. Uh, Johns Hopkins has the Hubble Applied Physics Lab. Goddard is in Maryland. Uh, so I spent three years being a space nerd, and then the internet happened, uh, and then I realized I could get paid about, I, I, I remember it to be $100 an hour, it was probably more like 20 or 30 <laughs> At the time it seemed like 100 yeah. um, where that was my first kind of foray into the web. 
Um, so I started doing websites. Uh, started actually started a food company in college where you could put in your college, the type of food you're looking for, and it lists different um, restaurants that would deliver. And then you could order online and have the restaurants deliver food to you. Uh, the only problem was it was 1996. Uh, any place that was open at 2 a.m. had no idea what the internet was, <laughs> did not know what email was, maybe had a fax machine. And so we realized that we could take those same restaurants and create websites for them. Um, and so that was kind of my first foray into web and media. Uh, I was a mechanical engineer while I was at Hopkins uh, doing microgravity stuff. I actually worked at NASA for a little bit. Um, but then I realized that I could kind of fast track this entrepreneurial journey but through software. Uh, if you're in aerospace, I don't know how many people are engineers, aerospace engineers. If you build a rocket, it takes 30 years of design uh, and it can blow up on the launch pad. It's a very slow moving industry. You can build a website in an hour and launch it. Uh, actually, you can build a website in like two minutes now or two seconds now, actually. Anyways, um, so that was my first kind of uh, involvement in web. Um, ended up uh, being hired as an early engineer for a startup in Boston um, after that, which was pretty exciting. Uh, that was the whole 1999-2000. Uh, um, it was the, the, the era of raising a ton of money, but then giving away a ton of money to get eyeballs because eyeballs were worth a ton more money. Um, it was kind of the internet economics at the time. That's when you made your first million. Oh, yeah. So... <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, if I That's had important. Yeah, That's if, really important. if I had a million dollars. Um what was that song? It was It was Fair Naked Ladies. Yeah. But you sing it for us? No. <laughs> <laughs> but it was your first experience of having a piece of paper that said you were worth a lot of money and then you know, buying the fifteen dollar martinis based on that paper and then it was the company went bust. Yeah, so yada yada yada. Um <laughs> Yada, yada, yada. Um, my car was repossessed. Some credit card debt followed me around for a while. But what happened was I realized that I loved that startup life. Um, it took me to Boston where I met Maggie. Um, and, and a well, far more valuable. A much more valuable. Experience. A long term. Oh, yeah. Long term investment. <laughs> Payoff yet to be determined. Um, <laughs> But, um, but yeah, no, and then it, 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 that experience sort of really branded me as a startup person. Um, I started working for a management consulting company. That didn't stick. It was the whole suit and tie thing. Um, and I ended up, uh, yada, 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 I ended up deciding I wanted to start my own company. I uh, started an insurance company, which was cash-based, and I knew it would be bootstrapping, which is a euphemism for being broke and eating 20 cent burritos for weeks on end. And I figure if I want to be broke, I might as well be happy. So I moved to San Diego uh, because for me, being broke and happy was living on a beach. Uh, in San Diego, didn't have a car, 20 cent burritos, but I started running. I started running a lot because running was free. Um, well, running, r running was free. Training for marathons is free if you can convince your friends and family uh, to pay for your team and training marathon training program. But I realized that um, at the time, 2004, this is a really long-winded story about how my, my fitness got started. This but is good. 2004, training for my second marathon. Um, who, who remembers the days where you used to kind of drive in your, jump in your car, drive around the neighborhood to figure out distances? <laughs> okay, so remember my car was repossessed? So I uh, did not have that for me. But I realized I could create a simple website where I could click, click, click and map my run. Um, and that literally was the, the reason um, how the site started, was I had this itch, uh, which was to figure out how to map distances. Um, I had a challenge, which was I didn't have a car, nor did I want to spend the $400 for a GPS watch. And so I created a website. So Map My Run really was created because I was too cheap to buy a GPS watch. And cheap? Uh, too poor. <laughs> too, too poor to buy a GPS So yada, 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 um, we sold Under Armour. Uh, couple years ago for a good price. So that was kind of how. Uh, disclosed price? Uh, 150 million, okay. so. And, and so you ran that company uh, with your co-founder for a decade? Yeah, so um, kind of another unique story with Matt My Fitness was um, a lot of people here in this room are, are business students and fellow entrepreneurs. And, and even with, with Maggie Louise uh, Confection, 
we didn't start with a business plan. Uh, we started with an idea, we started with a passion. And we just happened to find the right partners who were aligned in our vision where we raised money from a good group of angels. We didn't have to pitch, we didn't have to present. Um, in fact, we didn't even have a business model, but we had a couple individuals. Um, we had uh, Robin Thurston, who's now, uh, who is my business partner, my other co-founder, uh, who then went on to, uh, he's now still with Under Armour and is their chief digital guy, digital officer. Uh, but Robin and a couple investors behind Robin really believed that there was something here. Um, and so they, they gave us $200,000 to start the company. Uh, and they gave us a two-year window to see if there was a business. Um, and that was sort of our, our mission. It was, okay, with, it was about two hundred fifty. With $250,000, could, could we make a business out of it in two years? Um, and so yada, 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 we sold for to Under Armour for $150 million. We'll probably come back to this yeah. a little bit. But, but Maggie, was your passion chocolates? <laughs> Maybe, you enjoy maybe eating chocolates mm -hmm. as, a, as a child. Um, always a fan of sweets, <coughs> as most people are. But never once did I imagine that I would be doing this at all. Um, my story started a long, long, far away place from being in the kitchen. And um, I am the daughter of a fine artist, a painter, and a lawyer. And I've always struggled between having both skill sets. I thought I wanted to be an architect because that would be a good marriage of the two, but found it to be a little more on the, the engineering <coughs> side than my you know, aesthetic was interested in. So I went to law school. After I graduated from college, I went to Harvard and studied law where I met Kevin. He was not at school. He was just going to the school parties to meet women. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, I, I was there for three years, um, got exposed to the world, and decided what I wanted to do was move to New York City, work for a big firm, work on big deals, go to fancy restaurants, and uh, that was pretty much it. So that's how I spent my 20s. I worked in um, credit derivatives. I worked in synthetic CDOs. I worked on a number of products that you may have seen discussed in the movie The Big Short. Um, it was a very exciting time, and if anyone here, I know people here work on deals, it's fun, it's tons of work. When they close, you feel like a million dollars, and then you go home, get a good night's sleep, and do it all over again. So I was there for five years, and then I moved to Washington. I continued to practice law, um, and then Kevin and I together moved to Denver, Colorado, because that's where Matt My Fitness had relocated. Uh, because their angel investors that Kevin mentioned mm -hmm. were from there. And so it was 2008, and the market had basically exploded. So I knew I had to switch what I was doing. Um, I had wanted, at that point, to find a new career. Um, during my time practicing law, I had spent my weekends taking interior design classes, cooking classes, all the things you can do when you aren't married with kids. That's what I would do. Trying to figure out what that passion was and what I wanted it to be. Um, but when we got to Denver and Kevin was all in with Mount My Fitness, it, I, it was important that I actually had a really good salary and that we were still saving for retirement and had good health insurance. So I stuck with law for four more years and I joined a startup based in San Francisco and we were, I was their third employee, and what we were doing was being the first professional shareholder representative upon a merger or acquisition. So it was a whole new industry. It exposed me to building a company. There were 35 people when I left. Uh, I got to grow a whole team. I got to build out our process, our pricing, and all these different models. It was very interesting. But the reality, I still wasn't wasn't interested in the, the product itself. And I always tell people that when I wasn't working, I had no interest in reading about my, my work, my field, nothing. It was purely something I did at the office. You didn't have a passion? No passion. I had a passion for doing a really good job, but that was not the same as being in love with the, the industry I was in. So we moved here. 
uh, again for Mount My Fitness. We had an eight month old and I decided it was about time. So I went to culinary school and um, La Cordon Bleu here in Austin. And uh, at 6 a.m. every day in that uniform they make you wear as a hazing ritual. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but you know, while I was there, I, I was exposed to a lot of different techniques and different types of products that you see around the world. I spent my days doing a lot of photo styling and writing and development and realized I really wanted to start a business. I needed to figure out what that would be. And so at Le Cordon Bleu, um, we did about a week and a half of chocolate work. And it's there that I realized that this was a medium that's delicious and tastes so good, but can also be shaped you know, into an elephant or a, a lion or any shape you want. Uh, it can also be pink and purple. It doesn't have to be brown. Um, most chocolatiers are men, which is great, except there weren't any chocolate lipsticks on the market. Everything was was a little brown and heavy, and, and I just felt like it could be more fun and playful. So, so cre your creativity side was coming back out. Exactly. And so what I've found with the company I started after yeah. there was it allows me to marry, I like, get both those sides of my brain, the creative side, but also the business. So it's not purely in one court or the other, which, which is how it's a sustainable intellectual exercise and lots of fun every day. So Maggie, did you have to persuade Kevin that this is a business we needed to get into? Or was Kevin kind of saying, well, what should we do next? Well, I mean. Well, how did that come about? I basically said I was just starting the business. And, <laughs> <laughs> and what that means for Kevin, it wasn't the first time I, had done, I did that. When we were in Denver, I started a candy dish company because I really like antique glassware like most people out here, I'm sure. But, <laughs> <laughs> but the problem with liking antique glassware is then you have a house full of antique glassware and nobody needs that. So I started selling candy dishes paired with candy and I wasn't making the candy, I was buying it. And so, you know, Kevin supported me through that. I did that on the side, but he'd seen those wheels turning before. And so with this, you know, I said, this is what I wanna do and I think it'll be great. And we just did it. Um, I started at night because the only time I could get in the kitchen was 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. So that's what I did. And Kevin was mm -hmm. more than helpful as far as helping me and working with me. But he was still with Under Armour at that point. Ah, so when did you actually start this? To 2013. Okay. So he wasn't just with Under Armour. He was still with Matt My Fitness. There was no deal on the horizon. Yeah. So there was no no sense of that even happening yet. So you're, you're still running a startup. You've now got your own startup going. You're working all day, running somewhere in between, testing the product. You're working at 10 o'clock till two in the morning. That must have been quite a challenge. Like, when did you guys get to talk about things? Well, we're talking right now. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> It, we realized that I would have to work work with her for us to, to carry on a normal conversation. Conversation? Yeah. So at what point you carried on, Maggie, building the business, mm -hmm. um, what did you learn as you started to build the business in the early stage that you hadn't expected to learn or experience? Well, oh, those lessons. Mm -hmm. There's so many of them. It's hard to pick your favorite because they're all equally painful <laughs> and informative. Um, you learn what your limitations are. You know, you think that you can do whatever. Like, if you set your mind to it, you can make it happen. But you do have physical limitations, monetary limitations. Access to, you know, space for a kitchen was a limit. And, you know, finding out all of those tools and how to solve those problems. Um, work, you know, Kevin and I, figuring out how we were going to be a family while doing all this was definitely a lesson learned. And if you don't mind sharing, you have children. We have a four-year-old girl, and we're expecting another at any moment. So. <laughs> no no <laughs> sudden <laughs> move, movements. <laughs> um, you know, because Kevin was traveling a lot, which throws the schedule off because, you know, you've, you've got everything set for your end, but then 
the person who's supposed to take your kid to school that day is actually out of the country. So, you know, you figure out those, those systems. But we started to work together a year after the Under Armour acquisition. And it wasn't so that we could have a better schedule. It was because I thought Kevin could be really valuable to the company. And that's ultimately where my selfish reasoning lies. Yes. And we could spend time together. Well, <laughs> I mean, what, what, what Maggie's also leaving out is that period from when she first started um, experimenting. And at the Candy Dish Company in Denver, was also the first time Maggie had really kind of explored photography. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, antique glassware and old fashioned candy are bright, colorful. So that's where Maggie really sort of leveled up in terms of photographs. And so as she was designing and developing all this uniquely colored, uniquely shaped chocolate, she again turned to photography and, and started posting pictures on Facebook, not really Instagram, but it just, it photographed so well that all of a sudden there was interest from, uh, like, at first it was just friends and family, like any, any company starts there. Uh, but then it was friends of friends who received the box of, of Maggie Louise confections. And this is the whole time too, like where Maggie is learning about um, box suppliers. Like where do you even buy chocolate boxes? Like how do you price chocolate boxes at volume? How do you do photography that consistently looks good? So you talk about the the lessons you learn, well, it's like, well, the, the day we decided to go with a professional food photographer was sort of like, oh, wow, like, why didn't we do that in the beginning? Well, you couldn't in the beginning because it was not cost effective when it's just yourself kind of working four hours in the kitchen every night. Mm -hmm. um, but Maggie had built this company where she would be in the kitchen from 10, a, 10 p.m. to about 4 a.m. Uh, exploring um, making the chocolate, tempering the chocolate, producing the boxes, and then sleep, and then spend the daytime on building the website, on uh, sharing the photographs, on, on all this other stuff. And so pretty soon, like, press started noticing. I mean, this, the whole time, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm at Under Armour, I'm focused on the transaction and, and the transition from um, the Under Armour team, the Matt My Fitness team, the whole time, Maggie's like been building this like company and brand, and then not, then all of a sudden, Oprah's interested in selecting one of her favorite things. This was all before, before I was was involved at all. I was heads down with with Under Armour, wow. and that's where it kind of really came to like wow. A, I selfishly started looking at what Maggie was doing, and the green was, the grass was greener because here I built. Man, my fitness where I was doing everything to now all of a sudden a year in I'm, I'm working for Under Armour. I'm transitioning my team. I'm, I'm, I'm loving the culture, but it's no longer my thing anymore. And I look to Maggie and I just see this passion and this amazing, this amazing company being built. And I wanted in. I, I thought like, and Maggie and I were talking about it where she saw this amazing opportunity on the artistic side of selling chocolate. Like no one was positioning chocolate as a gift, as an artistic sort of medium. But on the other hand, no one was really applying technology either. So we were, we were sitting down, I think it was like vacation in August. Mm -hmm. Like wow, like if we take this art component that, that Maggie is, is developing, and we take like everything that she's put in, and then you just apply a little bit of technology to it, like it's like the art plus tech technology is what one of the ways that we think that we could win and it's proving itself out. Mm -hmm. So Oprah discovered you. Yes. How did she discover you? <laughs> she likes chocolate. <laughs> yes, she does like chocolate. Um, so when I started, after I got some traction and was really feeling the impact of that organic marketing, which is when you have a gift company, people send the product to somebody else. So every, every sale is an opportunity to introduce yourself to somebody else. And so after the first holiday season, when I saw those returns happening, um, I decided that I wanted to do something different with building this company. Most food manufacturers start local. They sell local, develop a following, and then they go national. Um, we have a very niche product. And it's pricey. So I did not feel that Austin by itself could support it. So I decided to just go national and then have it filter down locally. <laughs> and so I started working with a PR firm in New York. 
um, focusing on how do I reach people all over the US? Because right now, anyone can go online and discover you and learn about you and buy from you. You know, it doesn't have to be someone in your neighborhood. And so through working with them and through, again, photography, creating a story and an experience purely through a website, uh, which requires tedious and fastidious detail, which is exactly up my alley, um, you can create that, that storytelling experience for people. So Oprah found us, InStyle Magazine found us, because they're always looking for something new, something engaging, and something that's not, not trendy. You know, like we're not selling crickets and chocolate. This is, mm -hmm. it's, yeah. it's a very old-fashioned idea, which is a delicious treat, but it just has a fashion-forward, style-forward look to it and feel. And so when, when we were one of Oprah's favorite things, we didn't even have our own kitchen. So we were producing an incredible supply and amount of chocolate and shipping it all over the US. And we were sharing a kitchen space on Cesar Chavez with people who were making ramen noodles and barbecue chicken. Mm -hmm. You know, like it, was a, it was a testament to how hard uh, myself and my team members at that time, we really just, we just made it happen. When um, I, I have uh, spoken before to the founder of BlackBerry, Rim, mm -hmm. and he said when BlackBerry went on Oprah, it blew the company up. It, it just went nuts. They grew exponentially. What was your experience? It was similar. Um, you know, we, we grew, it blew up, but in a manageable sense. As a producer, you want as many customers as you can service. You know, you don't want a thousand people knocking on your door if you can't fulfill a thousand orders. So we saw a tremendous return from it. Uh, we also saw incredible credibility from it, which is the key to all of the press we've gotten. Today, you, you know, Vogue magazine and uh, Oprah or InStyle, it gives us credibility with our corporate clients. Um, they say, o Oprah has approved this. There, you know, there must be something there. And that's where the real value has come in for us. So you started with family and friends, but, <coughs> but Excuse me. You, you quickly moved to corporate clients. And yes. is that your one, or clearly one of your target markets now? Yes. You know, I, it, it kind of comes down to who you know and your life experiences. And my older sister works in the corporate gifting world. I would have had no idea that it existed, except for all of the tote bags and water bottles that I received when I was practicing law, you know, I didn't realize there's a whole world out there of promoting and selling and enhancing your brand through gifting. Mm -hmm. So it, it gave me an insight into that world and the fact that what we could provide was a very high-end, unique product for a company at a small volume because it's very easy to have an amazing crystal vase made just for your company if you're spending $100,000. Mm -hmm. But if you're spending $10,000, there wasn't really a market for that type of very high-end special gifting. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's another kind of opportunity that we saw and decided, let's make this happen. Yeah, and I mean, and it also helps too that as we're developing, as we're developing our product, the way Maggie looks at um, each collection is almost like a fashion collection. So each season we, we roll out design, prototype, we do like principal photography, we do all this months before it even happened. Like Maggie's actually already working on Christmas. Um, and so because we are, as a company, are, have excelled at building these specialized collections on a recurring fresh basis, we've given ourselves the capability of having a brand come to us and say, we want to do X, and we're like, wow, here we have um, a thousand different shapes we can work from. We can do custom <coughs> shapes, custom boxes, custom paper collateral, and take care of everything for you. Um, and so that like our chocolate box, when your client gets it, it's completely representative of your brand, of your messaging. Um, and again, you don't need to be doing a $50,000 order for that type of, that type of service. Do you produce all your chocolates now in Austin? We do. Mm -hmm. 
uh, on East 6th Street, we have a boutique and a kitchen and offices. And then we also have a facility off of South Congress. And so that's also, though, where the technology side comes in, is that the candy industry is very outdated. Uh, the equipment and machinery is the same as it was, what, 30 years ago? In the 40s and 50s. Right. Mm -hmm. So we want to make it much more in tune with the fact that the world has changed. Um, we want to be a lot more nimble than most candy companies who use large-scale machinery, which means if a client comes to them and says, I love that shape of the lip, but I want it to be hot pink, they really can't just change it quickly because everything is set up for a specific type of production. So that's where Kevin gets to exercise his mechanical engineering background um, as we try to move that equipment forward and create a production that fits with our fast turnaround times, our client responsiveness, and the fact that we don't want to invest $150,000 in equipment that hasn't changed in 50 years. We'd like it to be better first. And then one of the other ways we're applying technology is on the user experience. So we talk about um, sort of the, the values of Maggie Louise, and the first value is really the experience because being a gifting product, it's making that experience for the gift giver so personable and, and full of emotion. And likewise for the recipient when they open that box for the first time. And so part of that is personalization. And so um, on our website now, uh, you can actually go and customize a lot of our boxes. Um, but we have an online personalization tool where you can sort of select letters, spell things out. And I mean, we found, I mean, even last year where we didn't have these online tools, like almost a third of our, of our uh, consumer sales was a personali like personalized in some way, shape, or form. Um, that's either colors or Instead of like I heart mom, it's replacing um, a KC heart MC. Um, and so it's like all these like small touches where you can really build upon that experience of giving this really personal, personal, personal and beautiful gift. I was very fortunate. I was at a conference, the Austin 100 conference, and uh, Maggie Louise Confection graciously donated a box of chocolates to each of the members there. And they were customized for Austin. And there was a guitar and all the things you think about Austin. And it was absolutely phenomenal, both in taste and in looks <laughs> and in style. So moving away into more the personal side. So you're both in the C-suite, <laughs> right? You've both been in your C-suite elsewhere and now together. How does it work at husband and wife? Do you talk chocolates all day long? And, you know, how, how do you balance life with working together? Well, there's, there's no balance. Mm. Uh, you know, anyone who starts and runs their own endeavor knows it's, there's no balance. The goal is to have, to feel really good at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And we both love what we do, so we do talk about work a lot, but we like it. It's not necessarily talking about the financials, it's talking about the exciting things mm -hmm. ahead. But we also, we have some clear boundaries for working together. Mm -hmm. We work in different locations primarily. So at the end of the day, I haven't seen Kevin all day. Mm -hmm. You know, it's still coming home and having dinner. Um, we are very clear about who's in charge. And <laughs> it's really important because one of us has to be the ultimate decision maker. I, I think it says on the, uh, on the photo to the far left, mm -hmm. Keep oh. the wife, you know, oh, happy on wife. the far left. Happy wife. Happy wife. Happy, happy life. life. Happy yeah. life. <laughs> That's great. Well, and it is. I mean, um, like, it, in it's not just physical location, but um, with Maggie as a CEO and I'm the CEO, you think of, um, you think of like uh, a a P and L statement. She's top line, I'm bottom line. Mm -hmm. uh, she's front office, I'm back office. So we do have very clear kind of areas of expertise. But we also, I mean, this, that's why it's we're, we've been so successful because we, both of us recognize our strengths and, and weaknesses because we've known each other. We've been married for six years. We've known each other for almost 13. Um, and so we're able to kind of recognize and build and support each other um, as we do this. Because we didn't, I haven't run a chocolate company. Have you run a chocolate company before? 
Just this one. Yeah. So, I mean, we have no, we, like many days we feel like we don't have any idea what we're doing, but you know what? That's our strength. Right. Um, because, like, a lot of wine and chocolate companies won't deliver to Texas in June and July and August, yet we're shipping out of there. So, we look at that as an opportunity. They won't deliver because it's so hot. Oh, yeah, it's so hot. And, you know, it, I can't imagine just not running your business for part of the year because of the heat. So instead, we found a solution, and we ship all over the country and Canada, whatever time of year it is, um, which means we keep our kitchen running year-round. We keep people employed who love what they do. We keep the industry going and keep our name out there. Um, but working together, I mean, it does have its downside, you know, because when it's busy, we're both really busy, which makes it hard when you have kids and all of that. Mm -hmm. uh, when there is pressure, which comes with building a company, you know, we both feel it. Yeah. Um, there's that balance that we had when Kevin was building Mount My Fitness, and I had a great salary. Like, we don't have that now. Uh, but we have a lot more experience and we're a lot smarter and older, so I think we were able to handle it. Yeah. Uh, whereas 10 years ago, I think it would have been much more difficult. Yeah, I and mean, we were also blessed with, with a, a really flexible and wonderful daughter. Like her, her official job title at the company is CTO. Uh, she's our chief tasting officer. <laughs> uh, but she, I mean, like during the busy season, she hangs out at the warehouse. Uh, she builds box forts out of uh, builds forts out of boxes. She, um, I, I heard a large crack uh, one day, and I looked over, and I realized that she had like gotten to a, on a well a big dock, box dolly, and was pushing herself around with a yardstick and like snapped the yardstick <laughs> in half. But it's be, I mean we just were really fortunate because she's so flexible with us. I mean when she was three, she was we would make a little nest for her in the commercial kitchen when we were pulling late nights, like packaging and making chocolate that first season. So um, it is, but, but that's how Maggie and I are. I mean, we always treated ourselves, even when we were doing different things, when she was working with her startup in, in uh, Denver or when I was working at My Fitness, we always treated our relationship as a true partnership. It wasn't sort of like I had my family life and then I had my work life. It was like we had our lives, and that included sort of the, the professional and the personal and the family and mm -hmm. all that. Finding those unique partnerships, whether it's husband and wife or another partner, is unique mm -hmm. in life. If you have a question for our, our guest, would you please come to the microphone? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to ask another question, though, while people think about stepping up. Um, it seems kind of poetic that we have Map My Fitness and we're running around keeping fit and now we're eating a lot of chocolates. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, sorry. No, go ahead. Oh, like, uh, it's funny because um, uh, I, I used to say like, oh, like, uh, from fitness to fatness. But then I realized <laughs> that like chocolate's really not that, like good chocolate won't make you fat because it's so rich and delicious that you only want a couple pieces. Um, but then I kind of resolved in my head that like I realized like I'm a happiness dealer, where at Man My Fitness, I sort of made people happy through giving them a chance to be healthy and be active and be fit. And through Maggie Louise, it's sort of I'm a happiness dealer through chocolate. But also just through the, gift, the act of giving someone the ability to give an amazing box of chocolate, um, which is special. Mm -hmm. Sir. So. All right, hi. Um, Maggie, Kevin, you guys are both very successful entrepreneurs, and this is my this is only my second semester here at UT Austin. And you talked about finding your passion, and I strongly believe that my passion is in building businesses. I want to build businesses and startups and stuff. So if you were to go back in time and like give yourself advice at my age, nineteen years old, what advice would you give yourself? I would have to say, don't decide so early what your passion is, because there's so much out there you don't even know about. I, I had no idea you could hand paint chocolate and create a collection that's about a vegetable garden with the chocolate asparagus and chocolate carrots. You know, I, I, it didn't even cross my mind. So just being open-minded and not deciding you know exactly what the world will hold for you will kind of give you the chance to be exposed to lots of different opportunities. You know, I didn't realize I had a skill like this until I was in my 30s. 
You know, I, I, it, only then did I discover that about myself. So keep that in mind as you pursue what you want, that maybe you just haven't also realized there's something you love even more. Yeah, and, and I would say the same thing. I mean, I didn't go through college being someone who was rabid about um, being outdoors and running and being fit. And he did not. I did not. <laughs> For many years I did not. But it took me living in San Diego, looking at kind of my life and realizing, you know, like I love being outside, I love running. And it was like all of a sudden it was like, wow, like I just love this feeling. And that became my, my passion. And then I was able to sort of take that and pour that into Matt My Fitness. Um, and it wasn't something like I didn't, grad I didn't wake up one day in, in my early years and be like, yeah, I'm passionate about running. I'm going to create a running company. So just try lots of things. Thank you. Welcome. So. Thanks. Uh, this is mostly for Kevin. And I've got a high level part of the question and then a really deep personal okay. part of the question, which if you dodge it, totally cool. Uh, <laughs> but it, it has to do with, with the map of my story from a revenue side. Um, you know, pre-acquisition, especially in the early days, how did you carve it up and how did you, could you tell me some of the kind of ups and downs in your journey of being mostly a non-revenue based company mm -hmm. and what that meant for survival, how much you gave away, that sort of thing. I'd just like to hear that story. Um, the deep personal part, and then I'll sit down and just listen, mm -hmm. is if you wouldn't mind sharing like some of the actual percentage equity ownership of the company on day of acquisition or with uh, your current company with your wife, that would be really intriguing to me. Ooh, <laughs> wow. that is beyond personal. <laughs> I was yeah. expecting a totally different type of personal yeah. question. <laughs> um, so I can start with the easy question first. Well, the easy question was with Mad My Fitness, I mean, we were uh, eight years down the road, um, we had a angel round, a million dollar friends and family round, um, an AB round was our series A, which was about five million. And I think our series B was about 15 million, I, I don't remember. So if you can imagine like all the different principles. So as someone who had 100% of Map My Run when I first started, to then bringing on a partner for Map My Run, and then bringing on my third partner for Map My Fitness. Um, at the end of the day, um, I had less than 20% of, of um, Map My Fitness when it sold. But you know what? I would rather have that than 0% of, or 100% of nothing, <laughs> right? So it's, it's the types of decisions you make. Yeah, sure, I could have made different decisions to, to maintain more of my position and and, and all this, but at the end of the day, like I felt like I'd made most of the right decisions and I was completely happy with the outcome. I was really happy with my investors. Um, one of the things I tell people who are starting companies is don't look at your investors as wallets. Uh, make sure that your investors are people that you want to partner with regardless of whether or not they have money um, because you're pretty much getting married to them from day one um, and you always want to be aligned, uh, which is great from Maggie Louise and I. Yeah, it, uh -huh. it is very helpful in that context because we're completely on the same page with goals, ambitions, and outcomes. Mm -hmm. But as Kevin said, 100% of zero is zero. So when you look at equity, you have to think of it in terms of, would I rather have 100% of 10 or 50% of 1,000? You know, think of it that way instead of thinking of it as just giving something away because you're not. Let's go back and address that early revenue issue mm -hmm. for both of you. If, if you wouldn't mind, Kevin, Map My Fitness, uh, Maggie on, on Maggie Louise Confessions, how long was it before you actually started the company but got to either first sale or repetitive sales where you knew you had a real business here? So with Map My Fitness, it was our first six months. Uh, within our first six months, we got uh, our first $100,000 check. Uh, from a third-party advertiser or a third-party brand. And um, it's funny, and I'll tell you a story, I guess. So uh, with us, we were growing Mount My Fitness during a down economy, down recession. Uh, the markets were tanking. And we were trying to survive. Luckily, I had Maggie. Um, and so the as, yeah. The lawyer was working. The lawyer was working. And so I had, I had a, a true partner that could, that could keep keep what we were trying to build alive while I was trying to build Map My Fitness. Um, 
And on the other hand, like with Map My Fitness, we tried to monetize everything. Uh, if you were an early user of Map My Fitness, you probably would have received one too many emails from us, saw one too many banner ads on the page. Uh, we're trying to like upsell you right and left because we were just we were trying to rub pennies together to make it work, and it did. I mean, like people were like oh like revenue focus like we were revenue focused from day one, and the the story was that when we finally closed Austin Ventures, we kind of were like high fiving ourselves we're like yes thank God we don't have to think about revenue anymore, because now we can kind of be the next Twitter and just focus on user growth, and then our first board meeting AV is like so, how about that revenue number? Because that's that's very. I mean, you talk, you're you're on a hosting a panel, or on a, speaking on a panel about Austin and, and venture capital and funding. The Austin market has always been focused on revenue and results first, versus like at Silicon Valley. In a lot of ways, you'll have some markets that are very focused on growth first, revenue later. Um, so we were, our feet were always held to the revenue pools, but that made us a better company. That made us sort of a a better partner for someone like Under Armour to come in because not only did we, could we execute in terms of building this great brand and building this great vision, but we could actually show we can make money from it as well. So. And Maggie? Uh, I, had, I had revenue lined up when I launched the company. And that was again through my own network, um, through not just family and friends, but I had been in the business world for you know 12 years and had some friends who'd fi we'd finally reached that level where they were buyers and they were making decisions and spending money and had a budget. And so from day one, I had revenue. I did, did I have a margin that was good? No, you know, <laughs> I had no equipment, was doing everything by hand and buying 10 boxes at a time. So the margin came later, but the dollars in the door, definitely from the very beginning. So if, if I may, where do you think you're going to take the, the family company now? Hundreds of millions of dollars. Hundreds of millions of dollars. <laughs> that, no, I mean, what, I mean, Maggie can build on this, but I mean, we really see Maggie Louise as a brand being a luxury gift giving brand, and we see an opportunity with confections now, mm -hmm. um, but that's not to say that it sort of will stay in confections. Uh, oh. um, we've also I think there was a hint to that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there's a world beyond just chocolate, even though you wouldn't know it based on our life. Um, we've been able to reach a lot of people through you know, selling directly to client, to customers, because right now we don't wholesale, so you won't see us in any stores. You'll only see us on our website or through a couple of third-party channels um, like Domino Magazine and uh, Garden and Gun. But what we want to do is reach even more people. I mean, we've had a lot of success with lots of customers, but there's millions and millions and millions of people out there who haven't even seen what we do yet. So I would like to reach all of them, uh, continue creating at a very high speed, which keeps our current clients really engaged in the product and growing so that we're not, I want to stay in Austin as where we create and where we build and grow, but I want us to reach more parts of the country mm -hmm. as we do that. Maggie, would you give us an idea if, if it's viable of the kind of number of boxes of chocolates or pieces of chocolates you shipped last, last holiday season? I think it was... 500,000? No, I think it was like 200,000. Yeah, 200,000 chocolates last. Chocolate pieces, not boxes. Well, <laughs> they might be individually boxed. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Whoa, that's a lot of chocolates. <laughs> yes, yeah. it's a lot, especially when you think about the the number of decisions and actions that go into each of those chocolates from talking to a customer to taking a picture of it to tying a ribbon to making the chocolate it's quite it's, to, to it's a lot out. yeah our sourcing product sourcing product yeah. our busiest 12 hour stretch during last holiday season was 1200 boxes in 12 hours 1200 boxes wow yeah. It's a whole different perspective on things. So. Thank you, Maggie and Kevin. Uh, as, as far as Maggie Luis goes, uh, how do you ensure that your technology is current? And how do you sell in the months of June, July, and August? Can you elaborate on that? Uh, so there's two parts of the technology 
question. Uh, one is uh, the shipping. And so we actually found a company that specializes in working with pharma and biotech. Um, and so they have a so they have a solution that enables us to buy um, high tech material, but more importantly, it's material that comes packed flat. So if you ever get like a, a Omaha steak box or a Dean DeLuca comes in a big styrofoam box, like those are really great, but they take up a lot of warehouse space. Um, but this these packing solutions, it's high tech material. We actually have the option of having blood printed on the box for free. Uh, but we, we don't take advantage of that feature. Right. <laughs> right. Um, and so that's how, we, that's how we can get it. So No, he's asking, um, stay ahead on technology. Oh, yeah, the, he's asking about, the, yeah, so the technology front in terms of like shipping solutions and uh, keeping stuff cold. But then in terms of um, on the software side, um, A, like my background is in tech, and so uh, I, I like nerding out and keeping current with, with things. Um, we're using an e-commerce platform that's very um, extensible, uh, and they actually have a, a big sales office here uh, that we're going to uh, potentially start taking advantage of. But then we wrote our own like in-house production system and things like that. So. And for selling in June, July, August, it's not just about the mechanics of the shipping. Mm -hmm. It's how do you sell gift boxes to people when there are no holidays or anything like that. And I never wanted to start a company that was based on Valentine's Day, Christmas, and Halloween. You know, it's, that is a very stressful way to live. So that's why we balance it with corporate work. And so people who want to prospect for clients, who want to send a box with the editorial mailing they're doing, they do that year round. And so we balance those two so you have those revenue streams coming in 12 months of the year and not just in the, the Christmas and Valentine's Day timing. We have a number more questions, if I may, Chelsea. Hello, y'all. Um, I was really intrigued to hear your statement, Maggie, about your margins and um, just getting a product out there, even if the margins aren't great. Mm -hmm. Do you recommend that for aspiring product entrepreneurs? Or if you had to do it over again, would you try to tweak it to make the I margins larger? I absolutely recommend it. Yeah, just um, get out there and get figure out there, it out. See if you have something that people like. Because you can have a great margin, but if no one wants to buy your product, it doesn't matter. And also, sometimes the margins come when you can buy in volume. I did not want to be committed to a certain size box, for example, until I'd proven that that was a good a, a seller. And so I'd rather pay more for sourcing the boxes and not having a warehouse full of three-piece boxes that no one wanted. Um, and then once you prove that people want to buy it, you see what people are buying, then you can kind of invest and get those margins down. Same with equipment. You know, There's equipment that costs $5,000. There's equipment that costs $500,000. It's not really an option to start at the top you know, until you know that you have enough clients out there. So I would highly recommend putting the product out there. And have you been able to experiment with with price, did you have to go up or go down, or how, how flexible did you find that process? So I know there's a lot of ways to research pricing, and I'm sure that here at school we talk about it. I really was like, what would I want to pay for this? As a consumer who likes nice things, what do, what do I see? I decided I wanted to have a really great product that was under $50, because a lot of press and a lot of people, you have that in your head as like a, a marker of 50, under $50 for holiday. So $48 is where I started. And then kind of we fleshed it out from there. We have higher end items and then we have smaller, lower priced items. Online, it's higher priced. In the store we sell, you know, chocolate fish that are $375. So we were able to experiment after I kind of locked in with that, our basic like bread and butter product pricing is. Yeah, but we're, we're always, ex we're, like even on the shipping side, we're always experimenting with like, um, different pricing for the seasons and looking at conversion rates and things like that. So like there, there is a gut element to um, a lot of those initial sort of things, but then it's like fine tuning a lot of the minutia to kind of 
drive conversion rates and things like that. So once you've got, got reactions to start, get it out in front of a customer, then start collecting the data and adjusting mm -hmm. the plans mm -hmm. as you go forward. Yeah. Great. Right. Thank you. Nice um. Hi, I'm Tanaj Ferguson. I'm actually a first year MBA here, and I also own my own um, food company. It's a gourmet popsicle company called Lady Epicure. What I'm interested from both, I'm hearing from both of you is how, how have the mentors in your life kind of advanced you and how have they changed their, their role? How has their role changed as each of the, the visions for your company grown? Um, and then how do you continue to find those best fit mentors for you um, in order to continue to grow your company and make good decisions? I would say for me, I was blessed with a, um, a fabulous set of parents and most in particular, my father has always been a mentor to me. Um, he was he practiced law for years and had a wonderful career, but at the same time, really liked politics. So he ran for Senate in 1988. You know, took two years off work, traveled the state, um, put that went all in on it, and he lost the election. And then just went back and had a great career. And it was a great lesson for me and my sisters about. Life doesn't end if you fail or if it doesn't work out, you just keep going. And I've always been able to lean on him as far as advice. Um, not about should this lipstick be in gold and pink <laughs> or red and black, <laughs> but you know, it's a very good balance with the creative. Um, you know, my mom very artistic, my father very analytical. I've always had that, those two pillars um, of advice. And that hasn't changed as, the, as I've grown up. Yeah, and, and for me, um, one of the, the great things about the fact of when we moved our company here to Austin about five years ago was just the Austin ecosystem. And I'm sure like you, you, you hear this all the time, but the, the, the entrepreneurs and, and leaders here in Austin are so much more accessible than a lot of other places where you can pretty much Maybe Michael Dell might be a reach, but you could pretty much reach out to anybody and say, hey, I'd love to buy you a cup of coffee and get 50 minutes of your time. Um, and that's, that's what it was. I mean, when I first came here, um, I started getting involved in a lot of different things. I met Laura through um, Austin Technology Council, which I, I got involved with. Um, but then all of a sudden one day when I woke up and, and I was at Maggie Louise, I realized I had been living in this bubble of tech. And I looked up and I realized like, wow, like the Austin ecosystem is so much bigger than just tech. And you have all these entrepreneurs doing all these amazing things in, in fashion and beauty and food and, and, and vodka. And it's like, and, and it was a chance almost for me to build like a new kind of group of, a new group of friends. Uh, Maggie and I joke, it's like my little friends, like when I go to these happy hours. But it's such a great thing, like I don't necessarily have like mentors per se. But like I have this great group of people where I could go out and get a cup of coffee with or, or talk for like 10 minutes over a beer at one of these events and just get so much valuable feedback where I wouldn't even thought of, of some of the things that, that I, I gleaned from those. And, and I would suggest he gives that feedback. It's a two-way street. Mm -hmm. I've yeah. seen Kevin yeah. give and take both ways. So thank you. Thank the you. last question for tonight, I think we have a gentleman here. And then we will have a reception so you can talk to our guests. So. Hi, thanks for uh, sharing your knowledge with us. This has been great. Uh, so I coach uh, people how to start and grow their own business. So I'm always on the lookout for like cool growth hacking strategies. And I found a lot of cool stuff. But I'm wondering in your guys' experience, is there one or two strategies that have been like, let's try this and then you just got you know, way more customers than you ever expected? Or are there certain strategies that are working right now? Well, I mean, it's hard to not want more customers. You know, it, it's hard to see that as a negative thing, except, as I mentioned earlier, if we can't fulfill on it. Um, I think I haven't really seen anything that I thought was too successful. Um, but sometimes you try things and they don't stick. Um, but that doesn't mean they didn't benefit you in some other way that you, aren't, that you don't realize. You know, we have we do campaigns all the time for sales, and sometimes they don't lead to sales, but they lead to relationships that lead to sales later. So it's kind of making sure that the outcomes you're looking for are just as flexible as as how you're going to get there. Um, what do you think? 
Yeah, and, and in terms of like tools and things, um, one, one of the more recent examples comes to mind where we're looking at like, okay, well, South by is coming. Can we put together a easy to use tool where we let companies order um, large number of, of multiple boxes where if you have 10 VIPs coming, could you just do a one big order of 10, put in the hotel details, and we'll take care of everything. Well, for us, it was a two day, like a 20 minute conversation. Um, I didn't want to build the forms myself. Um, so I like found the site called formstack.com, uh, put some design layer on it, and then boom, we had this tool. And that tool wasn't necessarily um, extremely successful in terms of getting people to use it, but that opened up so many conversations for my team in terms of all the other events that we're doing in town. And so that unlocked a lot of opportunity just by kind of saying, okay, hey, this is great. Let's spend the, it took us probably about five, six hours to build this thing, QA it, iterate on it, and then all of a sudden, it, it led to so much more. There's also another example that I don't know why we didn't think of. Four days before Christmas, um, we did not, usually you know about press before, and you can prep the team, scale up, get ready, but four days before Christmas, um, Hoda from Hoda and Kathy Lee chose one of our boxes as one of her favorite things. And first of all, it wasn't one of our boxes. It was a corporate box we had created for Laura Mercier. So it was a box that we don't even sell, but it was ours, we made it. And so it was Monday before Christmas and we started getting insane traffic and sales on the website and phone calls to the store. And we didn't even know that this was happening. Um, they had the box on the show with a price attached to it. And like I said, we don't even sell it. And so, you know, it was a phenomenal day for us for sales because luckily Happy we Hoda sell. Day. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, luckily we sell like a ton of different makeup boxes at, at price points that were actually lower. So that's always good. You want to say, we don't have that, but I have something lower priced. Um, and we, you know, it was fabulous. But for a lot of our team, it was really, really disconcerting to not know that that was going to happen, to not be able to anticipate it, to go to, to work like three days before Christmas thinking we're just going to clean up today. <laughs> and it was like so crazy. You know, sometimes you have to think about how your team is going to respond to that. It's not just about the revenue and the sales that come in. It's about the, the morale and, you know, making sure people knew that we had no idea this was happening. I never would have promoted on national TV a box we don't even sell. Like, that's just <laughs> not good. <laughs> so that was, that was an unexpected positive sales outcome, but it had some, some negative impacts as well. Uh, well, I know we have lots more questions. Um, very unusually, we have gone over the 60 minutes that I cut everyone off at, uh, kind of by almost 10 minutes. But I think you'll join me in thanking our guests for this wonderful report. And I'd like to encourage you to join our dynamic entrepreneurial du duo here or outside for any other individual questions you might have. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you.